Today's virtual exploration starts at Stranra in Wigtunshire. We'll then keep heading northeast to Eyre in Ayrshire, Stirling in Stirlingshire, Glen Eagles in Perthshire, Edsel in Angus, and finally finishing at Lossiemouth on the Moray Firth. The 1938 guide showed a landing field just to the west of Stranra. Descendants of the tenant farmer, Andrew Love, still run the farm today. I did contact them. They were quite interested, but didn't have any further information about the landing ground. I found this aerial photograph on the excellent Britain from Above website. Probably not connected with the landing ground, but I found that the Westland Widgeon, G-E-B-R-N, a Widgeon 3, had been stored at Stranra after the Second World War. It was one of the few widgeons to fly again in the 1940s, flying from 1948 for a couple of years. But unfortunately in 1951 it was burnt when the owner couldn't afford the hangarage anymore. The site of the landing ground is now the Stranra Academy, a secondary school. The landing ground listed at Turnbury was formerly a World War I aerodrome. Turnbury Golf Course had been built around the turn of the 20th century, the hotel being built in 1906, but in 1917 it was all requisitioned. The golf course became an aerodrome, home to the School of Aerial Gunnery, and the hotel was used as a hospital. After the First World War, all properties were returned to their civilian owners, and the aerodrome site was sporadically used by civil aircraft until the outbreak of the Second World War. The property was once again requisitioned at the outbreak of the Second World War. The Royal Navy ran a hospital based in the hotel, and the RAF built an aerodrome on the golf course. The aerodrome was used for training and operations, Coastal Command flying Liberators, Hudsons, Venturas and Beauforts from the site. The aerodrome closed in 1948. Once again, the golf course and hotel were rebuilt. I did contact the present owner, an American gentleman. He knew little about pre-war AA landing ground at Turnbury, but he did send me this nice hat. The landing ground just to the west of Stirling Castle had also started life as a World War I aerodrome. In spring 1916, Royal Flying Corps Raplock was opened on the site of Fallon Inch Farm. The farmhouse was requisitioned, you can see it there in the background. The field was used for both training and home defence, but military activity had finished by September 1918. Sir Alan Cobham visited the aerodrome in 1929 on one of his tours promoting the creation of municipal aerodromes by local authorities. He was concerned that the high ground to the east of the aerodrome, with a castle on top, could produce turbulence in strong easterly winds. This BAC drone was photographed at the aerodrome. It was taken part in a British hospital's air pageant display and had been colourfully painted by the cartoonist William Heath Robinson to resemble a Chinese dragon. Northern and Scottish Airways Limited, based in Glasgow, occasionally operated services into the aerodrome, but in 1939 it closed, never reopened. A landing ground was located a short distance northeast of the Glen Eagles Hotel. The Glen Eagles Hotel had been conceived in 1913 by the Caledonian Railway 
but due to delays caused by the First World War, didn't open until 1924. On the 11th of May 1929, an air rally was held, with machines arriving from all over Great Britain. Maurice Jackerman, who we met in Episode 7 of this esteemed series, flew up direct from Slough in his moth, taking 4 hours and 10 minutes. Due to the attraction of the hotel and golf course, the landing ground was used regularly until the outbreak of the Second World War, but appears not to have reopened afterwards. A landing ground was available at Edsel, Angus, throughout the 1930s. It was operated by the Panmuir Hotel. I found out very little about it other than the Panmuir Hotel burnt down in 1951. The landing ground was located just to the west of the town. Probably a sheep pasture. It is still farmland. Somewhat surprisingly, for such a small town, Edsel has been home to three aerodromes over the years. In 1917, an aerodrome opened at Drum, just to the northeast of the town. It closed in 1919. In 1940, a new aerodrome was constructed, immediately to the southeast of the First World War site. Run by RF Maintenance Command, it was used for storage, repair, and eventual scrapping of aircraft. It closed in 1957. The aerodrome was used for motor racing between 1957 and 1959, but in 1960 the whole site was leased to the United States Navy. They built a high frequency direction finding antenna on the site and it remained in operation for 37 years, closing in 1997. The site is now used for commercial and industrial purposes. A landing ground was available just southwest of Lossiemouth throughout the 1930s. It was run by Mrs. Mustard, a widow. Her late husband, a colonel, had been found battered to death in the billiard room with a length of lead piping. In 1938, the Royal Air Force started building an aerodrome that would become RAF Lossiemouth. The aerodrome formally opened on the 1st of May 1939 the first units being training units equipped with Hawker Hart trainers and airspeed Oxfords. The airfield saw extensive use right through the Second World War from fighters, reconnaissance and bomber aircraft, and it was Lancaster's operating from Lossiemouth that successfully sank the Tirpitz in the Norwegian fjord in 1944. In 1946, the aerodrome was handed to the Royal Navy becoming HMS Fulmar. In 1972, it reverted to RAF control and became the home of the famous 8 Squadron Shackletons until their retirement in 1992. Today, it remains one of the RAF's busiest air stations, with several squadrons of Typhoons and Boeing Poseidon Maritime Patrol aircraft. It was August the 26th of last year when my younger son and I flew down to the most southwesterly AA landing ground near Hale in Cornwall. Of course it was August, you can see there's rain on the windscreen. In total there were 81 landing grounds listed in the 1938 guide and I've enjoyed researching the sites, aircraft and people who have turned up in these films. Maybe it's no great surprise that Sir Alan Cobham turned up the most often and Her Grace the Duchess of Bedford made several appearances. 
but it's the aircraft they were both flying that is the real heroine of the story, the Gypsy Moth. Conceived in 1925, this rugged, simple biplane opened up aviation in Britain like nothing before. It's little wonder Amy Johnson flew one to Australia in 1930, and I'm sure we'll take a closer look at the Gypsy Moth at some point in the future. This series is now ending, but I know there are plenty more old aerodromes for us to explore. Thank you for watching.